welcome back to another episode of the voice of the teacher this week i'm bringing to you uh what turned out to be a very great conversation brought about by a chance encounter on a wonderful social media website called linkedin if you don't know about linkedin any uh, professional should be using that to expand their professional network and to be uh, advancing their career so my guest this week is darren reed and uh, he was kind enough to take time out of his week getting ready to present a, at a conference in Austin uh, to sit down and do an interview with me. So without further ado, let's get to the main part of the show. And welcome to The Voice of the Teacher. My name is Jacob Montag. It is my privilege to have Darren Reed on as uh, my guest today. Darren, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jacob. Glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, Darren and I got uh, connected via LinkedIn for all of our listening audience. It's a great professional networking resource and found we have uh, a lot in common and uh, share similar ideals. And so I reached out and, and uh, invited Darren on the show and it's gonna be, it's gonna be a great interview. So thanks for uh, being with us today. Oh man, it's such an honor. I mean, time we can talk about education and teachers, you know, I'm all in. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, go ahead and start, tell us about yourself. Yeah. Well, you know, this is hard to believe and scary to say this, but this is my 30th year going into my 31st year in education. Uh, actually, this, I guess, 30 years ago this summer, I would have been finishing up my first year teaching, um, started teaching and um, never wanted to do anything but teach like many folks. And uh, but I had some some success in the classroom and um, wanted to, like many folks, expand my sphere of influence. How, do you, how can you impact more kids? And um, the natural thing for me was to be a school leader and uh, did that and had some success there. And in 2008, you know, a company called K-12 was doing this weird online education thing. Um, and they were looking for sort of proven educators to help uh, inform this changing demographic in online schools. It was no longer just the homeschool population. They were cross-section of kids in America going to these schools. And um, I went over and it was the best decision I made. It was very you know, tricky to go from public education to private education, but we run, you know, managed public charter schools and they were innovative and um, we use technology in unique ways to change how teachers teach and how kids learn and um, just been able to do a lot of great stuff. Um, I've had multiple roles in at K-12 now stride over the years including building some of the first blended and in online innovative schools across the country, um, uh, obviously working with boards and districts across the country, teachers and schools, um, helping change policies at the state and national level um, for, for school choice, et cetera. Uh, and then even left for two years to go serve as new leaders for new schools, um, uh, executive director overseeing their flagship program, the Aspiring Principals Program, which is exciting and building leadership capacity. And then I came back to Stride in 2014, here ever since. And now I'm leading a very exciting business called the Stride Professional Development Center, which is really helping to innovate the way teachers and educators experience uh, professional development. Oh, that's uh, quite a resume. That's awesome. And, <laughs> and I love the fact that you're in, in, in development, like uh, head of teacher mm -hmm. development. A, a lot of places you go, you don't see that kind of investment in their teachers. It's often easier Absolutely. to hire new teachers. So uh, what, what does that head of teacher development look like yeah. uh, at yeah. Stride? Absolutely. So if you think about Stride, you know, we, we service, you know, thousands of, of students and, and many schools and states across the country. And all of the students in school or teacher schools in our network, we, you know, as part of our partnership with them, we provide a quality professional development not only to help them understand what it means to be an online educator and all the pedagogy associated with that, but also just really good, strong pedagogy, how to build engagement and you know, deliver targeted instruction and all these great things. What we've done now with the Strive Professional Development Center is we've taken all of what we've known as a leader in online learning, um, all of the expertise we know, work with our internal folks, external folks, and we've created sort of a one-stop shop, which is a um, library of online ever-growing uh, library of digital courses for educators. Um, as you know, professional development in 30 years, we talk about my time in education, a lot has been innovated. Uh, unfortunately, professional development has not been one of them, right? It's one of a big pain for educators still, still face-to-face, -face, often episodic, often doesn't have the relevance, costly, time all the things, right? And we've surveyed many, many teachers and all the research goes back to that. So. Um, what we're doing now is we're taking how do 
how do we help educators take charge of their learning? So now we've created all this content and it's it's growing. The content, the topics, because there's not one thing that meets every educator's need, but we want them to be able to say, hey, I need some support in this, or I want to get support in this. And it's mobile friendly, asynchronous, you can start and stop anytime. Uh, it's interactive, it's video, they're not looking at a PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Oh, oh yes, and, and uh, that was that, those are some things that I always did not like about the early education. It was a eight hour lecture on why you should not lecture, and I always exactly. found that a touch bit ironic. Uh, you know, it's funny, Jacob. When I was a principal, and uh, you know, and I would work with my teachers, and they would talk about classroom management and kids not focusing, and then I would model by going and doing a staff meeting where I just talk nonstop for an hour. And you talk about somebody who's talking about classroom management, nothing worse than seeing a group of teachers <laughs> antsy and getting up and causing a problem. Nobody wants to sit in a room where you're just sitting and listening all day. Oh, and let me just go ahead and throw myself under that bus. Teachers can sometimes make the worst students in those type of environments. <laughs> I was one, I was one. <laughs> oh, so I'm such for we. So uh, quickly uh, transitioning, uh, more to a personal side of things. Yeah. Take me back to those days in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever you just graduated with your initial bachelor's degree, you've got what your state certification is required. You, yep. you got your first job. And I I'm just curious, how, how did the reality match the expectations? Oh, man, what a question. Not only in that first year, I think maybe 15, 20 years down the line in education, I've never said this one thing. And that was, wow, this is just the way I learned it in school. <laughs> it's it's on the job training and nowhere is that. And, and obviously I went to great undergrad school, Hiram College in Ohio, great preparation, extensive field experience, student teaching experience, but still there's nothing that prepares you for walking into that classroom with the full autonomy and accountability. And, um, but the fun thing about education is that, you know, I always learned that good teaching involves a lot of good stealing. And, you know, I was fortunate to be in a school with a lot of great experienced teachers and I just stole as much as I could until I got my footing, but it is frightening to say the least, uh, but rewarding at the same time. So in seven years in the classroom, uh, what subjects did you teach? Oh man, my certification, we were back in Ohio at the time where I got my degree was uh, first grade through eighth grade. So I taught literally everything from third grade through eighth grade in my seven years. And the way I was wow. able to do that is that I was one of the best experiences ever. I looped with a group of students. I was, at a, I was in a K-8 building and I looped with a group of kids from fourth grade to seventh grade. It was the most amazing experience and I've talked about it. And as a principal, I encourage that. But um, it was just you, you knew students and families at a deep level, particularly in the underserved communities in which I worked. It was so important. I became a part of their family. They become, you know, just it really allowed us to hit the ground running. So but yeah, I thought everything from um, all general subjects in elementary to the math and science piece in middle school, as well as language arts and history in middle school as well. Wow. Yeah, now looping with students, uh, just just so we can kind of clarify that for yes. uh, people who aren't familiar with that, yes. does that mean that you go start at one grade and continue with them? Yes, absolutely. So I was their teacher for, I just, you know, I took that same class for each year from fourth grade to seventh grade. Now they could um, opt out, you know, obviously families have a choice. And in all those years, not a single kid opted out of my, my classroom. And I think it was because there was a familiarity and comfort level. And those kids are almost 40 years old now, <laughs> but we still talk about that. I'm still in contact with those kids. It's amazing. That is amazing. So then the argument could be made, familiarity in the classroom can be a good thing when I, done I, correctly. So true. I mean, you know, one of the things I always say, you know, like, I, we do, if we were, you know, I joke and use this analogy before, but if we were going to, you know, a trip across the country to a place we've never been, think about how much research we do and planning we do and prep. And when you ask why, it's like, well, I want to make certain I'm not offending the people there. I don't know. It's new. It's a learning experience for me. I want to make certain I blend in. I want to make sure, right, get the most out of the experience. I feel the same way about education, right? And no matter what school community you work in, I've worked in affluent, underserved, 
it's how do you you understand the community so that you can immerse yourself and really meet the needs of the, of the student. Right. And so by understanding the community, I think that sometimes means living in the community because it's yeah. not just a nine to five job. You're doing life with people uh, yeah. of all ages, staff, students, administrators for yeah. eight to sometimes 14 hours a day. So true. And, you know, it, it, and so much has changed in our country. You know, back when I was in school, way back in the days where we went up, up and down both ways to school. Um, all of our, I mean, I remember my teacher living a street over from me, you know, and they would have cookouts. Like it was, and when I was a principal um, in the 90s, I did the same thing. Like I would, I lived in the community. I, yeah. Um, but as, as things have changed, as our, you know, technology has allowed community to expand and community is not just about proximity anymore. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the emphasis then is on us to make certain we create that community in every way we can, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, but in different communities. Yeah, and online, uh, just deviating for a second, online, mm -hmm. you still have those opportunities to create that community. Absolutely. That's one, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one misconception often is the community both online is, is strong, but there's also face-to-face -face opportunities, you know, in, in states where we have statewide virtual academies where families can get together, you know, and students can get together. That's really cool. And at Stride, we're doing something really cool uh, to test that out in something called Jetson Academy, where it's online and a lot of interaction and meeting people for the first time. And then that extends to the face-to-face -face as well. That's awesome. And uh, so in, you were, uh, in, this, in the classroom, it says from 1992 to 1999. Um, yep. And so just right before social media hit, just a little bit before <laughs> the internet. Uh, yeah. And so when you go from that, obviously you have the rise of technology, but throughout your years, like whenever you moved into the principalship, uh, how did uh, the rise of the internet, social media, blogs, uh, how did that uh, kind of change the game for educators? In your Man, opinion? that's... So just to really date myself is that I remember sitting in the in the workshop where they were teaching us how to use PowerPoint for the first time. It was a brand new thing. Um, oh I also gosh. remember. Yeah, I also remember that, you know, we could check out Apple computers to take home and we had Encyclopedia Britannica's disk that we put in. And that was the most exciting thing we could see. Then the third just thing that blew my mind, if you believe it or not, got to be 1998 is that we had uh, a, a program on a disc in a computer where if you put it in, there was a picture. I remember the clearly it was a picture of a desert. And with your mouse, you could scroll and you could see a 360 image of the desert, you know, and it just blew my mind. Think now of Google Earth and how much 3D technology you have. So it has literally been like, we are light years from that now. And uh, yeah. I think, Having grown and, and I was a principal at a math science technology focus school as my last principalship before I came to K-12. And quite honestly, Jacob, I felt like I was jazzing up a tower of records every year. Right. It was like it was like we, there was, we weren't really being innovative. And a lot of times we think if you just put computers in school, you get it wasn't really until I came to K-12 and stride that I realized, wait a second, we now can leverage technology to. I mean, because think about it, education is about time and space, right? I got to, you're here for a certain amount of hours, we're in this box, and as much as we can do within that box, differentiating. I remember giving tours about to families about, well, if your kid is, you know, more advanced, then they would be in this group in this corner. And if you, now technology just shatters that, right? And now we can, you know, first of all, our content is opened up beyond what we have ever imagined in any curriculum, but also, how kids learn and at what pace and how we monitor their progress it just put what we would what was already good practice on steroids if you will um and i still think we're figuring out how to do that one thing i love you know love about stride is that we figure that out a lot and i think post-covid districts everywhere are trying to figure that out even more now sure yeah and so uh with all with all that it would seem the days of one size fits all is now over it's, if it, if it's not, it's it's a travesty. If there's a place where they're still thinking it's one size fits all, it's that's the beauty for kids. And if anybody who has kids, I know you know I have two kids. My one just graduated college, one's a junior, and like most family kids in a the family, they're polar opposites. <laughs> 
and we have to be able to meet the needs of all of our kids' learning styles. And um, I think now we have the technology to do that. Yeah, and and so with the uh, with technology, it's it's not an enemy; it's an asset. Use it, make that quality uh, pedagogy with it, make that quality curriculum with it. So, um, mo- moving back into that, back in uh, back in the day, uh, I remember being t- uh, trained on stuff like Fundamental Five and Teach Like a Champion. Uh, yes. What what was the brick and mortar classroom management style that you followed for those of us who, for those who are in brick and mortar still? Yeah, man, that's so great. You know, it's the one thing I, you know, I always say the one thing I can speak confidently about because I did it, you know, roles now and learning and always growing. But one th- my strength as a teacher was classroom management. Um, and, you know, it's so funny because I used to do uh, workshops for schools on how to work with challenging students. And it was really difficult for me to share that because what they were looking for were like what's your what rules do you have? What what what's your consequence system? Like what are the things? And it really was not. It was some of that I should say. What 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 it you know obviously I, you know Ruby Payne. We worked in 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 an environment where there was a lot of poverty. Um, so understanding. I don't know if you're familiar with Ruby Payne, but she did a whole lot of research in the past on poverty. And during the time that was big in the '90s, um, there was also something the Search Institute called did call the 40 developmental assets. And I think this is important because what the 40 developmental assets did was it said basically every American, uh, the Search Institute created a survey and said, or uh, research, every American kid has the potential of 40 external assets. If they're fully self-actualized kids, they have all 40. Um, 20 of those assets are internal, 20 are, ex- are external, internal and external. Um, one, for example, is you know, and external ones. I have an adult in my life outside of my parents who are interested in my education, right? That's an asset for you. And so the more you have, you know, and so during that time, I think that if I recall, the average American kid had 18 of the 40. And so when you think about classroom management, it's easy to look at it as, oh, kids are acting up. But when you look at it in this perspective of, wait a minute, how do I help kids increase the assets that they have so that they can be more have more agency over the environment we create. And so I really use a lot of that. And um, so I would create mentor programs and all these different things. And it's never perfect. But then I would say, okay, as it related to classroom management, I literally, my, my foundation was the kids created our quote unquote rules every year. And they were not called rules. We call them norms. And it's like, how should we interact with each other in our community? And uh, if you ever, if you're educated, if you ever want, tough rules no nobody can create tougher rules than kids on themselves <laughs> i had to pull them back a little bit but i think the key is that they felt ownership in the fact that oh somebody actually cares about how i think we should interact in this environment and it and it worked for me um obviously there are rules and systems you follow with clear expectations but the key for me was involving the kids oh yeah and you know I, i've seen a lot of people do that in in uh brick and mortar settings they have the kids mm-hmm. They chime in with the rules, and they they're very successful. They can get kids of every level, yeah. To really, because I think it creates that buy-in piece. That's right. That's right. No, nothing better than when they have a voice in it, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and so the the flip side of the, I guess not really a flip side. That's not the way I want to phrase that. It's it's another component of that is the parent uh, component. Oh, yes. So how did you get parents on board with uh, yeah. your classroom management style? Yeah, it's it's so I'll give you two examples. One is I worked in I, I think I mentioned I worked in underserved communities of which I was familiar. I was a student of one of those communities, and but I also worked in you know Fairfax County, Virginia, where Colin Powell's grandkids went to my school, right? So it was as an as an assistant principal, and what I found was that the parent involvement was so very different, and a lot of folks think it's very challenging to work in underserved communities. Well. If you really want to know, it's challenging to work in a, in a school community where the parents understand their their voice in the school. They have time, access, resources to increase their voice in the school. And you have to know how to manage that and value that and make sure that they get what they need. Um, and that's a different skill set. Um, when I worked in underserved communities, um, so, so in that regard, it was a good partnership and we just ne- negotiated and sometimes had to push them away. And, you know, but in, in the other environment, there was a situation where, and I'll just, this was my philosophy, and I know it's not always popular, but 
I understood that the community I, did, I worked in, that a lot of those families could not spend a lot of time in school. The average education and household income suggested that they had to spend a lot of time working. Maybe they didn't have the resources or even the expectations of college, et cetera, for their kids. So there is something in education called in local parenting, right? And I took that to heart. Mm -hmm. I felt like because I was a part of that community that I brought some of those values and said, if you're in my classroom and now go back to looping, I had these kids for four years. <laughs> like I really became an extension of their family as opposed to sitting back and waiting for the parent, you know? And so, but it wasn't like I didn't involve parents. It was through the students then and the excitement they had in class and what they were doing. And then the parents were like, oh, but this is, seems pretty cool. Let me go meet this Mr. Reed. Let me go see what's going on up here. But I just, you know, and, and obviously there were great relationships we had with them. It was just a different approach to engage.